This week on the agenda, the future of food. Do we need to completely change the way we eat to end global hunger and save the planet? In 2020, it was estimated that the world's food system contributed 37% of total greenhouse gas emissions. By 2050, that figure is due to increase by another 30 to 40 percent. And today, 75 percent of the global diet is based on just 12 plants and five animal species. And two billion people don't have sufficient access to the vitamins and minerals needed for healthy growth. So what can be done to address these frightening statistics, which are only likely to worsen as the global population grows? Joining me now is Etherin Cousin, founder and CEO of Food Systems for the Future. Now, if we look around the world, there have been extreme weather events leading to droughts, to floods, to destroyed crops. And then we've got conflicts like in Israel mm -hmm. and in Ukraine. And all of this is contributing to, to food insecurity. So talk us through the scale of the global food problem. Well, until 2017, we were seeing a reduction in hunger. Now, with the first with COVID, and now, as you noted, with conflicts and climates, we've seen steady year-on-year -year increases, right? As we speak today, some 800-plus million people are chronically food insecure. But what should be even be more worrying is that 258 million people are facing high levels of food insecurity. And this is from a report that was published by the World Food Program and the EU called the Global Report on Food Crisis, their mid-year report, which came out in August, which was before the conflict in Israel and Gaza. And the challenge is that right now, as we sit here talking to you, some that 258 million people add on the Palestinians, where some 50 percent of the population, as WFP recently reported, is on the verge of starvation, and nine out of 10 people cannot, uh, cannot access food on a regular basis. And this add, let me add one more number that I think is important, and that is that 3.1 billion people cannot afford a diverse and nutritious diet on a daily basis. The numbers that you're talking about are, are huge, but, but the global community has this goal to, to end hunger and malnutrition by 2030. I mean, it, it's ambitious. Do you think that the world takes the global food crisis seriously enough? The, the the world does, uh, in fact, created that goal to support uh, ending hunger by 2030 as part of the SDGs, and it was through that seriousness of uh, the, that serious desire to end hunger that the globe, the entire global community, embraced the goal. The challenge is the investments that are necessary to support the change in foods, the transformation of the food system, is not coming forward. And one of the biggest challenges that are affecting those numbers is conflict. And conflict without peace, we will not achieve the global food security, the, the global food security goal of ending hunger. Tell us a little bit about your organization, Food Systems for the Future. How does it work? Food Systems for the Future was founded um, in five years ago with the goal of moving beyond just programs, supporting the transformation of the food system through the scale up of businesses, particularly that can provide access to more nutritious food for those in underserved communities. That by providing the business acceleration support, the partnerships, the policy changes that is necessary, the advocacy, and most importantly, accessing capital to support the scale up of businesses that can change the food system, the, the outcomes of, of, of access to food in, to, in communities where capital historically has not flown. Um, where do you see technology uh, being used effectively? Um, and where do you see its potential? 
Now, the, where technology is being used effectively is bringing on new seeds. For example, Bayer has a new uh, dry, uh, direct seeded rice that uses 30% less water and uh, provides more resilient rice cultivation. The, we see new tools coming online to support the to support more drought resilient uh, crops and more uh, drought tolerant crops. We see new vegetable seeds uh, coming online that make fruits and vegetables more abundant and easier to harvest. All of these tools that that are coming online that can change the the efficiency of of agricultural production, particularly during a time of climate climate crisis, are quite critical to ensuring that we can produce the 50 percent more harvest that FAO tells us that we'll need by 2050. Erthryn, you, you've spent your career um, tackling global food insecurity. I mean, are, are we in a, a better or a worse place than we were when you began working in this area more than 40 years ago? 40 years ago, be, um, and, fi and let's even go back 50 years ago, when we still had large famines in China and India that resulted in millions of deaths from lack of access to enough calories. We don't. We are not experiencing those types of famines um, directly related to lack of production. We've increased production significantly, but the reality is that production increase has been of primarily grains. We've not increased the production of fruits, vegetables, legumes that are necessary to support that diverse diet, and that's what we've learned over those past 40 years, that just filling stomachs is not enough. It's about ensuring that we're providing the access to a diverse and nutritious diet that, that ends hunger and also supports health. That is critical, particularly for children, to ensure the ability to live life to their full potential. And none of that is, as I, I underscore again, the substitutes for providing the humanitarian system, assistance that is required. Because when I began my work at the World Food Program, the majority of the of the, the the hunger that we were responding to was in those places where the rains didn't come or the or the there were floods and as a result we saw acute hunger now what the 6 out of 10 of those who are who are acutely hungry today is directly ref, uh, um, uh, 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 directly created by conflict and so i go back to we're doing more we're doing better but what we need to do is ensure that we're meeting humanitarian needs and also that we're supporting a food system that not only provides enough calories, but does it in a manner that supports our environment as well as our human health. Ether and Cousin, thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity. The world's poor clearly need more secure access to the global food system. But hand in hand with that, goes the need for a more sustainable approach to food in wealthier nations. So exactly what might that look like? Well, joining me now is Dr. Lujan al Khodmani, Director of Global Action at Eat Forum. Thanks for coming on the agenda. Now, I, I want to cast your mind back to a survey um, that, that you conducted where 42% of respondents said that most people will be eating an entirely plant-based diet in a decade's time. Why is that? So we conducted this survey from, from consumers from 31 countries around the world. That is around 30,000 consumers. And yes, you are correct. It's 42%. Um, they believe they have more growing trend toward plant-based diets, especially among younger generations, and to be even more specific, in the regions of Africa and Asia. So this truly reflects the awareness of environmental impacts of our food, of meat consumption, and the growing interest in sustainable and healthy eating habits. So, but despite this general perception, there's a growing trend, 
there is one thing that's interest, and there's another thing that's the actual consumption mm. of plant-based food or plant-based diets. So although most people say they're eating, for example, a healthy diet, only a small percentage of them eat a plant-based diet. However, this really represents an opportunity for large-scale adoption. Um, okay, okay. So, so, so why do you think that, that meat and, and dairy are driving the climate crisis? Just first, please allow me to underline that our current food systems alone are responsible for up to one third of the global emission from production, transport, processing, consumption, food loss and waste, the whole system. Agriculture is one of the greatest causes of water pollution, air pollution, and the climate breakdown. And the sort of lion shares or cows share that is actually by livestock farming. Livestock industry contributes for around 14.5% of the global emissions emitted by the livestock and the production of the animal feed. Deforestation, foul gazing, and feed further exacerbates climate impact. And this disproportionate use of arable land underscores the efficiency and the environmental cost of the current practice and our current meat consumption. I mean, some of the statistics are, are, are mind-blowing. Dairy production alone emitting more greenhouse gases than global aviation. But plant-based foods typically have a much smaller carbon footprint and require less land, less water to produce. But what then is your plan for the millions of livestock farmers around the world who are already struggling to, to make a living? Our call to action is transitioning away from intensive livestock farmer in a just and fair way. And this includes the support for farmers. So solutions include diversifying food from sources, supporting structural um, transformation agriculture, investing in new job creation with sustainable food systems. Actually, the International Labour Organization expects that overall some 15 million additional jobs from uh, dive, shifting towards more healthy diets and plant-based diets in Latin America alone. So it is an economic opportunity for the farmers and the whole economy as a whole. So there are three things that will help us to navigate this impending revolution in employment and the income of farmers within the food and land use systems. First, increase the quality of the existing jobs. Um, there's a recent trend that have eroded the quality of the rural agricultural job. There is a pressure on food prices have held down agricultural incomes. Industrialized supply chains have shifted the value creation away from the farm gate, shrinking farms, and have prevented leveraging incomes at scale. So this upshot is an economic crisis in many rural areas with younger people actually abandoning farming for life in the city. So we need to improve the condition and remuneration of farmers and fisheries related job is urgently needed to address this downward trend. Second, create new jobs in this emerging sector. So this transformation of the food system will not just mean less food and fewer job for developed countries. It means transition to more jobs in alternative protein and nature restoration. And for developing countries, there will be likely more jobs created in traditional agricultural um, sectors. Last but not least, cushion the transition. For millions, changes in food and land use system will mean the loss of their jobs and livelihoods. So we need to address their needs and aspirations are a core to this transition. You mentioned policy, um, but um, that, that drive to get us to consume less meat is a, is a bit of a political hot potato, um, isn't it? I mean, the livestock industry has a huge sway um, in policy making, particularly in, in Western countries, doesn't it? Yes, um, indeed. And actually, food systems is hugely influenced by, um, by external uh, powers, powerful corporate interests facing challenges in actually reforming our systems. And our food systems are kind of characterized by marked asymmetries in power, information, accountabilities. We have powerful corporations using their influence that affect the policies and the policy makings, delaying those reforms. We are will be um, launching our global policy reports on Food System Economic Commission on the 29th of Jan in Berlin. And it highlights three ways to assert such public interest in food system reforms. First, we need to emphasize the intended public benefits, such as better child health and lives, saving 
people's life with healthier diets, build constituencies for reform. Second, we need a broad-based multi-stakeholder coalition to change their cooperate power. Such coalitions will be instrumental in, 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 in persuading governments across Latin America to raise taxes on sugary beverage, for example, despite corporate lobbying against them. And last but not least, we need to use new taxes to change incentives, like the tax revenue, directly to interventions which command broad support. For example, Bolivia. Bolivia finances its healthy school meal programs from a tax on hydrocarbons, converting natural capital into human capital. So is plant-based eating no longer just a personal choice, but a global necessity? It's a, it's a global necessity. And it is um, quite crucial to ensure that everyone, everywhere, can afford and have access to such diet. And affordability is kind of a very, very critical issue with over 3 billion people unable to afford a healthy diet. So there's a differences between low middle income countries and high income countries. And even there are differences within the same countries themselves impacting vulnerable populations and the most uh, uh, population than the most where the existing social gaps between different groups. So we need to ensure that um, the solutions in place improve the access to such affordable, nutritious diets for all, diversify those diets, reduce food waste, and shift to more regenerative, sustainable um, uh, uh, food, pra food practices. Because as you said, it is a necessity, but we need to make sure that this transition is just and fair for everyone. Dr. Ludran al Kodmani, thank you very much. Thank you. Still to come here on the agenda, why pest-resistant beans will be key to the future of food. We are all connected. Across borders. Across continents. Connected by ideas. A shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back to the agenda. One of the key foods of the future are beans. They're cheap, high in protein and B vitamins, and can be grown in a wide range of environments, from ocean shores to mountain slopes. The Pan-Africa Bean Research Alliance works to create new varieties that resist pests and disease. And its director, Jean-Claude Rubiogo, joins me now from Nairobi. Now, you talk about the bean being the superfood of the future that can save the planet. So tell us a little bit about beans, how they can combat the climate crisis, beat global malnutrition, and create that much needed shift in farming. Right, that's a very good question. Yeah, so beans, like for Africa, it's a food, staple food for closer to 400 million people. Uh, they consume beans for various reasons you mentioned, a source of proteins. Uh, cheap proteins, minerals, a number of them, potassium, uh, and iron and zinc, vitamins too, very good fiber in, in beans, very good for various health benefit. So beans go very well with the other dishes. It can be beans or gali, a meal based, a maize based meal, meal. can be beans and rice, favorite of many dishes. So, but as we said, yes, climate change is real. It's affecting beans too, but beans also is a solution. Uh, it's a solution in different ways. Uh, through our capacity building and, and breeding, uh, our breeders have been able to go to variety with a short duration, definitely, which requires less water, uh, that's safe 70 days. So that's really short duration, early maturing, that requires less water. They also less carbon footprint. They don't require a lot of fertilizer. They may add a little bit of nitrogen fertilizer, which is good. It's a nature positive crop. Tell us about the Beans is How global campaign to double bean consumption by 2028. Beans is How, we are part of that uh, campaign and that movement. Uh, yeah, it has, uh, it has a theory of change. Uh, 
in one area where the beans consumption consumption is less, uh, probably in some countries, uh, we see how again to put to, to create awareness, demand. Was there's uh, the health and the nutritional benefit of beans definitely, so that people can consume more because beans also has several other nutrients which probably even animal protein don't have. So we are looking on how do we double the consumption. How do we get better products which are convenient and highly nutritious and very tasty for the consumer? Uh, again, in order to consume more, uh, if they consume more beans, that's less uh, food climate footprint, uh, but also gives income to the smallholder as well. We also in some areas, uh, beans are less available. That means the production is not that high. Uh, so we need to see how do we double the production, the productivity to get more beans on their table. So it, depending on the country, we certainly have a different uh, strategy, but all is to double the consumption because beans have a lot of health benefits, cheap source of proteins uh, and, and minerals. So a lot of health benefits we should exploit, but also very good for ecosystem, very good for farmers too, yeah. In Burundi, in Rwanda, people eat almost half their body weight um, in beans each year. But if we look at other places, um, I, I'm thinking of Zambia, it's only around, around 10 kilograms, so considerably less. What initiatives are out there to change that uneven spread? That's a very good question. I'm from Rwanda originally, so I know what, uh, even me at home, I consume beans three times a day, breakfast. Uh, and also lunch and supper when I'm at home. So I can imagine how it can be surprising. So yes, uh, true. But in other areas, yes, the consumption is less. We need to understand why it's less. One of the areas I think about is that less available, uh, less uh, production is available, it goes to the market. So we need to increase productivity there. We need to increase the production. We need to get a better technology. We need to scale up the, the technology to go to the communities, definitely. Another way is also processing beans to other products, definitely, because that cooking time is long. If you have to cook three hours and you're looking for another one, which is easy to cook. So we are looking on products. Uh, we're working with the companies in Zambia, for instance, Trinity Food, so that they have pre-cooked beans, which goes to the market, which goes to the schools. School have to cook beans for three to four hours, even five hours. So now the beans, which is pre-cooked, they can only warm and consume. So we're working with various Zango multifaceted interventions to get the, the beans to the table from production uh, to make it available, from also processing to other products which are convenient too. So all that play a role, but also incomes of people, definitely. Uh, again, farmers need to be incentivized in order to produce more. That's what also we are working on. So there are several angles where we are really making a difference. That's the way we're thinking about them too. The European farming sector is pretty stuck on cereal crops. So how far do you think that mindset might hold back the shift that you're hoping to see in farming? All right, yeah, maybe they, we need to, to bring them and the land from Africa because we have a diversified uh, system, cropping systems. Even people, as I said, yeah, they do beans and and maybe maize or sweet potato or, or or cassava or banana and other crops. I think it's good to do crop rotation. So we need really to to look at the value, not just the crop. This is good for food, for cash, but also good for ecosystem. So we need really to to create awareness about the ecosystem services and health and sustainability of the entire planet. Uh, how these uh, legumes and and pulses can contribute to that as well. It's a process uh, because you also need to get uh, the right genetic materials in, in the hands of the farmer, create a market, so that's uh, create a demand, so that the farmers are incentivized. Mm. So it's, it's really working in that regard. Yeah. But you see um, trade potential here as well, don't you? I mean, tell us a little bit about the, the bean corridor and, and the scope to create new markets. Right, yeah, so this is uh, something Pabra and the Bean Program we have pioneered for quite some time now. Uh, we started uh, sometimes in 2004 in Ethiopia, where the export of white pea bean, the ones which are canned, were 
only around 8 million with the two exporters. It moved to closer to 100 million export per year with the closer to 460 exporters employing closer to 200,000 people. So there's a lot of benefits. So we took that experience across. How do we link the consumption hub, understanding what drives the consumer, and then you develop the production hub. That means the right variety which the consumer is looking for, the seed systems to get this variety, which is efficient to get these varieties in the hands of the farmer. Also working with that, adding more agronomy, better uh, agricultural practices, climate smart, and then working with also the people who will buy from the farmer to go and distribute in the in the in the consumption hub, looking on the challenge they have across the production, mm. the, uh, the, the the distribution, and as well as the consumption. And that's create incentives to the value chain actors so that they can invest. So you find more people interested, farmers investing, because they have a better return on their investment. The traders are also interested. So it's understanding how the consumer drives the production and then how also the distribution comes in to take to the consumer. So it's, it's really, it's a game changer. We have seen really doubling the productivity across many countries in, the, in, in Uganda too, uh, where the, the regional export moved from 80 million five years ago to 132 million. Uh, Tanzania where the productivity has doubled, Burundi the same. So they've been corridor, it's really a game changer because it links really uh, our research to, to the reality and to the consumption and the distribution and the production. Where do you see the, the investment coming from? You, you've mentioned that the individual farmers uh, might, might change the, the way they work, but in terms of the bigger picture, where do you see it coming from? Right, yeah, so we, again, we're still very appreciative of the donors who have been supporting us, a number of them. Uh, from Global Affairs Canada, SDC, USAID, BMJ, ICR, and the government in Africa. Increasingly, we find private sector investment. I mean, we want to continue with this investment from donors, uh, but also we're seeing complementarity of private sector, investing in the seed production, investing in, in the grain trade, creating infrastructure uh, as well. So in the future, we're really private sector we we'll start investing maybe even the research. That's something we can work with them because they're interested in making money in, in this product. So I see, again, investment from private sector, investment from, 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 from the donors, investment also from, from the government. But more important that if you have a vibrant value chain, we are seeing that financial services, the banks, they're also interested in that value chain to capitalize it because they, they know very well that this is something which works. So we're in discussion with the several banks here in East Africa and to see how they can start looking on the farmer as an investable character, uh, the traders as an investable character, and then they, they, that becomes very, very useful to everybody. How do you see gatherings like COP28 um, helping move the dial in terms of plant-based proteins? I think this is very important that uh, really, as I said, like beans has less carbon footprint, has uh, less water use. Has, so if the, the more these proteins of, of pulses, beans, uh, lentils, chickpeas, and, and cowpeas go to the agenda of the policymakers and people can understand, then they can support these, uh, these crops, which are good for, he for health of the people, health for, for the the health of the planet too. So that's what we really should encourage and should give examples. Uh, Pabra is one of them uh, to really say as example uh, where we, we can use and provide evidence so that's uh, really the policy makers, the public investment is well uh, directed toward what we need. Yeah. Jean-Claude Rubioko, thank you very much. Thank you too. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out at The Agenda Show on TikTok. Next week on The Agenda, we'll be coming to you from Davos as the great and the good gather for the World Economic Forum's annual meeting. 
But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all the Agenda team here in London, goodbye. <laughs>